Keep your eyes on him. Wait a minute. I have one of these that's a very special card for everybody here this morning that's got my name, Brother John, and uh, Concord Baptist Church pastor on there. It's got my telephone number, my cell phone, my email address, and the church now, Concord Baptist Church, has a website. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, it's just in, under construction, but it's a good beginning for our website. Thank you. Would you help me? Give one of those to everybody here. Would you help me too? And if you have a mic, stick your hand out. Ladies, if y'all would help me. As well. Give one of those to everybody here. And I want you to stick that in your wallet somewhere, in your purse, or put it in the dash of your car, or up on the sun visor. It's just my, my business card. And uh, I make it myself, so I can change anything on there. I don't put my picture, I don't want to know what I look like before I, they see me come and they'll run. But take that and uh, keep it handy. I keep my cell phone with me. It's actually in the pastor's study right now. Okay, kids, did you keep one for yourself? All right, keep one for yourself. Take two for your dad. You know somebody else did? Uh, take one too today. Thank you, kids. Thank you. I had a really neat idea, Donnie. I was going to glue a quarter to all of these. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think I was going to do that? Here's a quarter. <laughs> but it costs 35 cents now, and I thought, well, I can't afford to give that much money away. I ain't. But that's the sentiment behind this. Here's a quarter. I guess here's my card. Call someone who cares. Now, here's what what uh, I'm, I want you to take, take this. And I I love. I'm very happy to be your pastor, and I want to, to be a very good pastor, not only to you but also before the Lord. But uh, you know, I, I want you to know to keep this that I I'm very intent on on bringing glory to God and ministering to you. But you know, I. I I'd have to tell you that giving this card to you doesn't mean that I have all the answers to all of your questions. Or they I have, that I have solutions. I'm going to put these right here. That I have solutions to all of your problems. I, that's not what this card means either. It also doesn't mean that every time you call me that you'll get me. Sometimes you'll get my voicemail. Uh, and uh, especially if I learn by caller ID who the troublemakers are, I won't even answer your call. I'll just, <laughs> ooh, that's... That's Doug. I'm not talking to him right now. I'll let that one slide. I'll try not to do that, Doug. If you call me, I'll, I'll try to answer if I can. But sometimes you're going to get a busy signal. Sometimes they, I just won't have reception on my cell phone. Sometimes the battery will be dead. My son, I had to walk about a mile to call me on the telephone uh, Friday night. Friday night because his battery was dead on his cell phone. And the uh, car car quit on him, so, uh, but uh, my, my battery runs down sometimes in more ways than one. Uh, but, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes you'll call me and I'll say, you know, I, uh, and you may say, I, I, I have a flat tire preacher, I want you to come change it for me. I'd say, no, I, I can't get away, I'm sorry, I'm at work. Can't, you have to change that, call your wife to let her change it for you. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess it's giving you my card, or, and I, we're going to start printing, I, I believe it's in the bulletin, I think Debbie said it was already in the bulletin this morning, let me see, yes, there's my number right there, and uh, if you have a computer and you're uh, hooked into the internet and you have email service, you can just email me, and I, I answer my, I, I check my email really about as much as I do anything, That's, I, I'm really a computer geek, eh? so I'm really in, into computers, but uh, email me. And uh, I'd love to communicate to you with that way. If you have internet service, check out the website. And I'm always open for what you'd like to have on there and uh, uh, what, what you'd like to see. It's just a very basic uh, site right now, but it's enough that if you gave it to someone, they would be able to find where our church is at, what time our services began, who some of our leaders are, and how to get in touch with me, uh, kind of what we believe in and how we're affiliated with other Southern Baptist uh, uh, organizations and so forth. So it's a, it's, it's a good beginning, as I said. Uh, I wanted to, to tell you, I even try my very best. I, I'm still going to fail you at times. I'm not going to come through. I'm not going to be able to be everything. Uh, you're, you're, I especially right now, this is, we pastors, you know what we call this period right after you become called to, uh, to a pastor? 
Miss Jean, I know, knows, but uh, she can't answer. The honeymoon period. I'm on my honeymoon again. I'm so happy. Uh, and it'll be my anniversary at, on uh, April, uh, March the 26th of next year. But this is a time when probably you're thinking of me very optimistically, enthusiastically. If I haven't made you mad yet, just give me some time. Just, I, this is still very early. And uh, if I hadn't upset you about something, just please be patient. I'll get to everybody as soon as I can. I'm an equally offensive pastor to everybody, so I'll probably preach in a certain way or say something. or I'll, I know I'm going to do something, and, and don't be disappointed until I get to you because I'm trying, I'll try to, to upset everybody equally. So, and you're going to have to love me, not because I'm a lovable person, but because Jesus loves me, okay? But right now, uh, you, you're going to be very enthusiastic of anything new, but the news is going to wear off. This face doesn't get any better. It just gets worse and worse. And, uh, but uh, I do love you in the name of Jesus, and I'm growing to love you as new friends and as family members of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I'm so excited about being here. And the reason I wanted to tell you that, I, uh, there, the three, there are three people here this morning who know me better than anyone. And uh, this is my wife, Terry. You, you met her. She doesn't attend church very much. You probably already figured that out. Uh, <laughs> But y'all pray for her and work on her, okay? Buy her Sunday school. Brother Don, she if you can't get her in the choir. She can sing pretty good. I'm going to work And, you know, but uh, it's a shame, you know, when Patrick's wife can't even get her to come to church. And she didn't come to Sunday school this morning. And she's already told me she's not coming back tonight. So pray for her. She, and maybe she'll come forward this morning during the invitation. <laughs> She is not the assistant pastor, okay? And she's not the associate pastor. She's a member of this church. I told her I joined her up last Sunday. She said, good. I said, they accepted you too, but your vote wasn't as good as mine. <laughs> so she just barely got in. She is a very good pastor's wife. Her number one ministry is to keep me going, okay? Not to wait on you. Does that sound ugly? See, I, I think I made pretty good ground. I may have offended almost everybody all at one time. Here, we'll get it done in a hurry. She's going to work hard in the church, and she's a good pastor's wife. She may not be everything that, uh, that you think a pastor's wife ought to be, but she, in some areas she'll be even more. She really loves to work with children. She loves babies. And she doesn't care for, much, uh, for you adults. I'll just be honest with you. Okay? She loves little children. And I can understand that, too, because I've already found it hard to love some of y'all older people. My firstborn is Carice. Carice is here. She's 21. She's a senior at Maryville College. We've nearly gone bankrupt trying to keep her in college for the last four years. We're poor because of her. But Jonathan wanted to come along and do his part, so he enrolled at the University of North Alabama this fall, and so he's a freshman there. I want you to meet them later on, Jonathan and Carice, my daughter and son, and I'm glad to have them here this morning. They, they don't live at home. They live at college, and so they just, they just happen to be here this morning. And I'm glad you'll see them from time to time. I, I hope that they will consider Concord to be their church. I hope that you'll, you'll minister to them as, the, as you have opportunity to because uh, I, I remember one time when Jonathan was sick as a little boy and I was, I don't know, maybe too busy and he told his mother, he says, I want my pastor to come see me. <laughs> I was too busy, way too busy. But uh, I want you to meet them today. I'm glad to have them here today. And uh, turn with me, if you would, in your Bible over to John's Gospel, chapter 14. John's Gospel, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I can't fix everything. If you talk to these three people right here, they would tell you that I'm not a good person. I'm a saved person. Uh, I, I, I have to work very hard. I go home and I said, Terry said, How'd this, last week, she said, how'd the sermon go? I said, I, I didn't cuss in the pulpit. I, I, I did all right. I don't think I said anything too terribly inappropriate. I try to refrain. I do the best that I can. I'm... I've uh, been a Christian since 1970, and the Lord's still working on me. I'm not perfect by any means, and uh, there are times I haven't been to all the Creases basketball games. I haven't seen Jonathan every single time he's played in the band. Uh, there have been, uh, I think I've been present for all birthdays and such. Uh, I think I've remembered all my wife's anniversaries uh, so far. Where this is to be our 30th anniversary, I think that's that pasteboard anniversary, and then when you get something for them that's made out of pasteboard or cardboard or something. I'm looking forward to that, but uh, 
If you were to ask them, they, I, they know all about me, and they know when I lose my temper, they know when I'm weak, and they know uh, when I'm close to the Lord, when I'm far away. Uh, there have been many times I've failed as husband and father. I've never been unfaithful to my wife. However, there have been other children that I've had doings with, and uh, so I've cheated on my children with all the other children of the church. And we've adopted a lot who've passed in as friends of my children as they've come through the years. But uh, I hope that they would tell you that they love me uh, in spite of all that uh, they know about me. And I hope that there's a lot of things they won't tell you about me. But having said all of that, I wanted to talk with you this morning. I wanted to share with you, and I'll do this too, I, I would never want to give you the impression that I know everything about God. We have a little uh, boy that's a member of my brother's family. And uh, he was, he's, uh, his name is Jacob, and he's about four years old, and they were getting ready to go to church. So they go to the First Baptist, to the to Hoover Baptist Church down a little bit south of Birmingham, and he was just didn't want to go to church. And they said, well, Jacob, why don't you want to go to church? And he says, well, I've already figured out everything about God. Why should I have to go to church? So he's only four years old. He already knows everything about God, you know. So he figured out he's got a, he's got a good excuse for not having to go. But uh, believe me, even, uh, even a four-year-old doesn't know uh, uh, I, I like those who, you know, someone was, a little boy was uh, drawing a picture in the living room floor one day on a piece of paper. And his daddy came in and said, son, what are, you, what are you drawing there? He says, I'm drawing a picture of God. You're drawing a picture of God? And the little boy said, yes. And the daddy said, well, son, nobody knows what God looks like. He says, well, when I get done with this picture, they will. <laughs> there, that's what God looks like. But I found as I get older and older, I, I'm finding that I, I'm figuring out that I know less and less and less than I ever thought I did. I don't know everything. And so sometimes I'm going to come in my sermons. Sometimes you might call me and say, Brother, Brother Bain, why is this like this? Why did God allow this to happen? And, and there, there are some times that I may, be, I, I may be able to see from his word. I may be able to see some light or, or some, uh, some understanding. And maybe I've had an experience and I can share with you what I think God might be up to or what he's doing or what he's done. I might be able to show you a verse of scripture that explains exactly what you're worried about or concerned about. But many times I have learned a long time ago that if someone asks me something that I don't know the answer to, I'll just say, I just don't know. I just have to tell you, and I want to be honest with you, I don't know what God's doing, and I don't know why this happened, and I don't understand this. You know, I wish that I could tell you that even though I've been studying the Bible for now 36 years, that I wish that I could tell you that I know everything in the Bible and that I understand it all and that it all, it all makes sense to me, but I'd have to tell you that I don't. I look to the Word of God for wisdom, for leadership, and for guidance, and I don't understand everything. And so I want to share a passage with you this morning or, or some verses that deal with a subject that I have to tell you that I don't understand everything about it. And, and even I read in the Word of God, and I see it said there so very plainly, I come away saying, I, I'm not sure that I understand completely what this means or what it's about. I don't believe there's anything wrong with that. I, I, I hope that there's some virtue in that, in being able to be honest with me and be honest with you. And I'm, I always try to be honest with God. There's no sense in being anything other than that with Him. But there are many times when I say, Lord, I don't understand. Sometimes I say, Lord, I, 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 I can't believe. Remember that father there in, in the Gospel of, of Matthew and Mark? It's in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. It's also the same story told in Matthew, chapter 9. Where the Father said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Sometimes I just say, Lord, I, I'm having a hard time believing this. I, I wish I could tell you as my congregation that I believe in everything that the Bible says. There are some things that I just can't understand, though, and I'm looking at it and I say, Lord, I need your help believing this. Sometimes I'll look at verses of Scripture. There are times when I, dis I disagree with God. I, I always lose arguments with God. He's always right. But there are times when I say, Lord... I, I believe I understand why you did this, but I disagree with it. I would not have done that if I were God. Uh, you may not play God a lot yourself. I was uh, one of the shows that Terry and I watched. We have two or three programs that we try to catch or tape, watch during the week. We're not big television addicts, but we have our programs that we watch together. And uh, there's a program where the other day someone was talking about someone was playing God. One of the main characters of the story says uh, that I'm not always completely happy with, with the results when God's playing God. You know, sometimes I don't even I don't even like it when God's playing God. 
Sometimes I have to admit that I see things in my life or things in the world and I say, Lord, I just don't know why you did that. But I see evidences in the scripture that other saints before me have questioned God or doubted him or have, it's their weaknesses, it's my weakness. So I want to share something with you this morning in this light. Even though I've passed out a calling card today that has my name and how to get in touch with me, I, I, my greatest concern is not that you be able to get in touch with me, but my, I believe that one of my greatest tasks or, or missions as your pastor is to, to help you understand how to get in touch with God, how to talk to Him, to find out what His number is, and to let Him be not your, uh, your last resort, but the very first person you think of about everything. And to, He is someone who does know the answers to your questions. He may not give them to you now. He knows the resolution or the solution to all of your problems, though he may not solve all of your problems in this life. God is the only one who's never going to be someone who is going to fail you. Or he's not going to be someone who is going to leave you or neglect you. It's important to know him and be able to have a personal relationship with him. Far more important than knowing a pastor or how to get in touch with him or depending upon a pastor for anything. But let me show you something right here. Let's look in John's Gospel, chapter 14. And Jesus is, remember, talking with his disciples and he's teaching them some very important things just before he knows that he's going to die and he's going to be placed in a tomb. We know he's going to rise again, but then he's going to ascend back to heaven again. And he has been back in heaven, seated at the right hand of God for 2,000 years. He's teaching his disciples some things they need to know. It says here in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 13. I'm going to ask you to follow me to several verses here. John's Gospel, 14, 13. Jesus says here, And whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you will ask anything in my name, I will do it. Look at that verse 14 again. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Look, if you would, now over to John's Gospel, chapter 16. John's Gospel, chapter 16. John 16, look at verse 23. It says there, In that day you shall ask nothing. Verily I say unto you, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto, or to this point, up to this point, up to here, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Let's pause for just a moment of prayer right here in the middle of this message since we're talking about Jesus teaching his disciples about praying and about asking. Just a moment, let's bow our heads. Father, I, I don't know if ever in this life I shall completely understand everything the Bible says about praying and about asking for what we want and need from you. But I, I pray that we would sense your heart and know your mind more than anything else in this matter because it is when we feel that you know our thoughts and what's in our heart and what's in our minds every moment of our life that it gives us peace and comfort knowing that you're listening to us, that you are there for us. And that you are not weak and frail. You are not human. You do not have a human nature. You do not make human mistakes. And you love us supremely. You care for us so deeply. Teach us, even beyond our understanding, to accept and to believe today that you want us to pray. You want us to speak to you. You want us to call out to you with the knowledge with the assurance and the comfort and the peace, with the enthusiastic trust that you are listening, that you care, and that you are always, always, every moment of our lives, forever working in our behalf. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. I just read four verses to you, and this is basically what, they, what they're saying. Jesus speaking, not only I believe to his disciples who are there, here with him, but to you and I. And he's saying, I want you to ask me. Ask the Father or ask me. He says, I want you to pray and ask of us. 
He says, if you'll ask the Father in my name, he says, I'm, I'm telling you, what we want you to do is you to ask for something, and we will answer your prayer. We'll give you what you pray for. All you have to do is simply ask, and it is yours. Jesus says, up to this point, you haven't asked anything. He says, I'm saying ask. Ask, and you will have it. Now, I want to tell you that I, it seems to me that those verses speak very clearly and very plainly. But I want to tell you here this morning that these are some of the most difficult verses for me to understand in all of the Bible. Because I have prayed many times with great faith and prayed with great hope and great trust. I have sometimes prayed to the Father and always in Jesus' name. And I'm here to tell you this morning that not all of my prayers have been granted. I... I, I don't live in a world where I feel that all I have to do is ask God for something and the ne very next moment I will have it. You know, there, there are so many things at work here. One of them is my, my lack of understanding or sometimes my human limitations, the limitations of, of my own mind or my own heart. But I also know that when Jesus spoke these words, Bible scholars tell us that more than likely Jesus spoke these words to his disciples in their in their common everyday language, probably in Aramaic, which is a, a form of, of ancient Hebrew, which was a, 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 it was a Hebrew alphabet, but a different vocabulary and grammar structure. Jesus grow, grew up speaking a language called Aramaic. Nobody speaks it today. It's a dead language. When John recorded these words, he recorded them in, uh, as the Holy Spirit gave him uh, inspiration the Gospel of John, this book of our Bible, was recorded by John initially, originally, in the Greek language. Now, I can, I can read from the Greek New Testament, and I can translate from the New Testament, and I'll try not to impose that upon you. Every once in a while, I need to say something in Greek so I can feel like i got my money's worth for my college and seminary education. So I'll, I'll tell you what something means in chicken scratch every once in a while, and it won't be to show off. It'll just be to say, okay, I didn't waste all my time translating all those verses seminary. But if you've ever worked with other languages, if you've ever spoken with someone who doesn't speak your native language, which some people say around Ardmore it's English, but I don't believe it. I, have, I, I sell engrave, laser engravers, and we had someone call me from headquarters the other day, said, I have a lead for you, someone in East Tennessee that is thinking about buying a laser engraving system and he's in your territory, but I, I'm sorry we couldn't help him. I just couldn't understand him. He has some kind of speech problem. So I said, okay, I'll give him a call. And so I called to him and I began talking to him and I didn't have any trouble understanding him at all. He didn't stutter or stammer. He didn't have a... And I was expecting someone who had a terrible, terrible speech impediment and found it difficult to talk. And all of a sudden it didn't register with me why this Yankee from up in Michigan couldn't understand him. He was talking East Tennessee. And that's just a variant of uh, North Alabama. I could understand him, but I could see it was, you know, East Tennesseans, they do speak in a little more uh, pronounced Southern accent than we do. And, and I could understand, I could say, well, that's why Jeremy couldn't understand this guy. He's just talking slow and dragging it out like that. And just, I said, I, I got it. But when you're working with languages, there's no such thing as a word for word or even like an idea for an idea of translation. There's, you know, some people, some languages don't even have a, a, a word for this or that. They don't have an equivalency. And sometimes you're just working with the best that you can. And so I don't know exactly what's going on here. But I know that that I've seen some of the most godly people that I've ever known in my life pray for something that they felt was very, very important to them. It wasn't something selfish or just something that wanted riches or fame. or They, they weren't just praying for some kind of self-satisfaction, uh, but they were literally praying for something that was truly important. And I've seen that God did not answer those prayers. So I look at these verses, and, and one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to say, Lord, did you say these things? Or, or what did you mean when you said... Or, or, Lord, how, how are we to understand them? That if you, if you ever want something, all you have to do is just ask God for it, and poof, it'll be there? I, I don't believe that. You know, I, for one thing, I'm, I'm a, I hope that I, I've tried my best to be a good father. 
And there are a lot of times when my children have asked me for things, and I, I've not granted those requests because they've asked for things that they didn't need, they didn't want, they shouldn't have. It would be wrong for, those to, for them to have those things. I know God is a very good father. And as a very good father, he's not going to give you something that is dangerous to you or something that is harmful. Even if it's something you think you need or something you think you desperately want, if you ask him for something that, that he knows would be harmful to you and would be, as a matter of fact, a very bad thing, I believe that a loving Heavenly Father is going to refuse to grant your request. Now, if I were preaching this sermon in a Pentecostal church, they probably would have all gotten up and left already. Because they, you know, and if you're from a Pentecostal background, or maybe you're a Pentecostalist, or a, a Assembly of God, a Church of God, they pray about everything. They say, Lord, let the sun shine today. And then it come out and says, it's a miracle. The sun is shining. Or, Lord, let this light turn green. And all of a sudden it turns green and I say, praise Jesus, it's another miracle. I'm just seeing miracles all the way to work this morning. I'm, I'm being facetious, you know. Uh, I know the light's probably going to turn to green whether I pray about it or not. I certainly hope so. And sometimes it doesn't seem like it's going to. But if you're just, you know, I, I think sometimes it trivializes prayer. If you just say, Lord, I'm praying for rain today. And Dan Satterfield says there's an 85% chance. Pretty good odds God might answer that prayer and you'd be able to thank Jesus all day long because he let it rain. I don't know everything about prayer. I don't understand prayer. But listen, I know something very important. I know God is not like a genie in a bottle. You know, we have three wishes. Or that he's like a leprechaun. Or he's like a lucky charm. Or, or that God is, is like a, a, an Aladdin's lamp genie. Or, or that... He's, he, he has, that, all you, that God is at your beck and call, that He is obligated or He's required to do whatever we tell Him to do or whatever we ask Him to do. Listen, let me give you two examples. I just want you to mark these down. We're not going to look at these passages, but if you were to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you would see there a, a writing of Paul the Apostle. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says that he had a thorn in the flesh. And that means he had some kind of physical disability or some kind of physical ailment. We don't know what it was. Some people believe he had an eye ailment, an eye problem. He may have had malaria, reoccurring uh, chronic malaria. We don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Well, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that Paul says himself, of which I beg God three times that he would remove it from me. Have you ever had a pain or an ache or a sickness or a disease or a hurt or a difficulty and you ask God to remove it? You could even go to these verses and say, I'm going to put my hand on these verses that says all you have to do is ask and you can have it. And you've claimed those. Paul says, I ask God on three different occasions, please deliver me from this physical weakness and sickness. And Paul says, every time I prayed, God said no. Now listen, friends, when you talk about how good a Christian you are, I'm not even close to as good a Christian as Paul the Apostle. Do you think he probably believed when he prayed? Do you think that maybe he uh, had faith when he prayed? Do you think he prayed in Jesus' name? Of course he did all those things. And he earnestly, genuinely, sincerely sought God through prayer to deliver him. And God said, no, because I gave you that thorn in the flesh. And he gives him the reason. Paul finally says, I, I understood what God was doing. Let me give you another example. I'm not going to give you the passages for this. But all you have to do is look in the Gospels. Do you see in the Gospels that on the night of Jesus' arrest that he went into the Garden of Gethsemane and there he prayed. He prayed three times too. He said, Father, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. And we know from what he was saying that using the symbolism or the metaphor that he was using, Jesus was saying, Lord, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to be nailed to a cross. If there's any way that you can save these people without my having to go to the cross, he says, I'm begging you to remove this bitter cup from, so that I don't have to drink it. I've never met anybody that believed anything other than interpreting this as Jesus went in the garden and he knelt down and he prayed and he was literally sweating blood and he was begging God, God, please, is there a way that you can 
work this out, that you can work salvation without my having to die on the cross. And he would come back out and he saw his disciples sleeping. He went back in and he says, he went in three times and he begged God, God, would you please work this plan of yours in some way that does not involve my death. And each time God said no to his own son. Or, you know, not even that. We didn't even see that here that, that Jesus got a no. You know what he got? He got what you and I probably have gotten in, in the past. The silence of heaven. You ever got that? Paul says, God told me no. There's no way it ever says in the scripture that God ever even spoke or answered Jesus' prayer. Jesus just simply got silence. God didn't say anything. God didn't say yes or no, maybe or wait. God was silent. Listen, if Jesus could ask for something three times, do you think he probably had enough faith? Do you think he was asking in the proper name and in the proper way? And yet God was silent. If there is something that Jesus might ask for and God refused to grant it, do you think there might be something in your life and in mind that you might pray about and God would either say no or that he would be silent? I think there's a good chance that might happen in your life. You know, when I look at these words, I just don't doubt these words because of that they're written here, or that I know what they say. So I know that sometimes Paul prayed for things and God said no. And I know that even Jesus asked for some things that God didn't respond at all to. Jesus knew he was to stay on track and to be obedient because he came here to die on Calvary's cross. I want to close this morning by telling you that I don't know what was in the disciples' minds and you might say, well, you know, if, if you and I, if we actually follow Jesus' words, but he was speaking to these disciples. Maybe you think, you have thought sometimes, well, I'm not a good enough person. I'm not faithful enough. I didn't have enough faith. I, uh, I really am not living the kind of life that is worthy of asking for anything. You know, you look at these people that Jesus is talking to. The twelve disciples were some of the most ragtag people that you'd ever meet. There's probably not a one of you here this morning that I wouldn't put up against any of them at any time. All you have to do is study the Gospels and find out that these people were not the, the brightest bulb in the box. They were not the sharpest tool in the shed. And they were not the, most, the greatest spiritual giants that you've ever known. Well, in the very end, friends, they're even going to forsake Jesus. One of them is going to deny Him and one of them is even going to betray Him. And all the way to Jerusalem, you know what their spiritual discussion was? Which one of them was the greatest? That will kind of show you what kind of Christians they were. Listen, they needed the grace of Jesus. And they loved Jesus dearly. And Jesus loved and died for them. But listen, if you think the disciples were spiritual giants and so therefore could pray these kind of prayers and have all of them answered, it's probably, you know, because of what you know, I believe there's probably some of you this morning that if you had to give your life for Christ, you wouldn't run away and hide you wouldn't betray him or deny him. You might even give your life because you know more than these 12 men did. I don't know what was on the disciples' minds when they heard Jesus say these words. But I'm going to guess, and I'm going to tell you, I think I may know what was on Simon Peter's mind because he had already voiced this concern. He would already made this prayer in the form of a demand. Let me tell you how I think this conversation might have gone. Maybe they have a little break in the action, a little bit of pause. And they're, everybody's, the teaching is a break is here. They're still, they're getting very close to Jerusalem and Jesus has been teaching, but here's just a moment of everybody's kind of scattered around to take care of different business. And I believe Simon Peter might have slipped over to Jesus and said, Lord, did you mean what you said when you said that you just want us to ask? And all we have to do is ask and you'll give us whatever we ask for. Did you mean that? And Jesus would say, I meant it with all my heart. If this conversation had ever taken place, let me tell you what I think Simon Peter would have asked for. I believe with all my heart Peter would have gotten right in front of Jesus and looked right up into his Savior's face and he would have said, Lord, I am asking you right now. I'm begging you. In your name, please don't go to Jerusalem. 
Please don't go to Jerusalem. I'm begging you. I'm asking you. This is my prayer. This is my request. I know that I demanded it before. And I know that I said, not so, Lord. But Lord, if you never answer another prayer in my entire life, this is the only prayer that I'm asking of you right now. Please don't go to Jerusalem. Please don't go. Because I believe that what you've told us, that that very exact thing is going to happen. They're going to take you and they're going to kill you. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you, please. And I believe Jesus would have looked into his face once again and said, Peter, you're still talking like the devil. <laughs> I'm going to have to say no to your prayer because I've got to go to Calvary. If I don't, then all is lost. All is lost. Listen, friends, God is doing something important. He's doing something larger than we are, and it's larger than we can understand. It's bigger than we can even imagine. And sometimes what we're going to ask for and what we're going to plead for and what we're going to think is so very important and it is to us and it is to Him. But He's doing something that we can't comprehend. And I believe sometimes He's going to say no to our prayers. We're not always going to get what we pray for. We're not always going to get what we ask for. But let me tell you what I think these words mean. These words that Jesus spoke means... He wants you to ask Him. He wants you to pray to Him. He wants you to open your heart to Him and let Him know what your every want, your every desire, what your every need is. He wants you to always rely upon Him for anything and everything. And He wants you to know that He has the greatest eternal desire to do every good thing that is possible in God's creation for you. He loves you so much that He only wants you to have the best. And He wants you to have anything and everything. It's not always going to be possible to grant you all of your requests because it would change His plan. And what He's busy doing is He's saving as many people out of this world as He possibly can. And I believe that sometimes because of that, sacrifices have to be made. You see, friends, I, want to, I don't want you to be disappointed in God and think that, think that maybe He hasn't answered your prayers because He doesn't love you or because He doesn't care. And I don't want you to read these verses. And if you listen to these verses, uh, the televangelist is going to tell you that while you can just have Cadillacs and diamond rings and you can live in big houses, you can have millions of dollars, and all you have to do is just believe in God and just believe with all your heart and trust in Jesus and claim it in the name of Jesus, and you just have it. Because... I don't believe that God has ever made that promise to you and me. He wants us to trust in Him no matter what. And He wants us to trust Him even more sometimes when it seems that our prayers have not been answered. Or when it seems that heaven is ignoring us. He is not. He never is ignoring us. He's never turning a deaf ear to us. He's never abandoning us. We shouldn't be disappointed in God. I've made the point to say, God, I don't know if this is what you want from me or not, but I'm asking you to grant this prayer. We prayed for little Billy, and God granted that prayer. She's back. There's still more to pray about in that regard. We're praying for folks who are sick, and sometimes we're hearing such great reports. You pray for my wife, and she's back here today, and she's mending, and she's getting well. We should pray for each other and pray for the things that matter for us. With the understanding that God loves us, He cares for us, and He wants to grant every wish and every prayer that we could be able to possibly have. And He will do that. As all that fits within His plan of getting everybody out of this burning building that we do. Would you pray for me? Father, if there's someone here this morning who needs to pray the prayer that says, Lord, I need to give my life to you, that I can guarantee that that prayer will be heard and answered, and that request will be granted. But if there's someone here this morning who's lost confidence in prayer because they haven't gotten everything they've ever asked for, I pray that you would touch their heart and let them feel your heart. That you might overcome that disappointment in their lives. If there's someone whose faith has failed or become weak, and someone maybe who hasn't even prayed to you for so long,